Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Gabe. Hi, I'm Tanya, a member of the Prince Edward Group, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Tanya. <laughs> So I was very nervous uh, for this speech all week, Um, and usually I would come up with some sort of like witty joke or something like that to say at the beginning, but um, we're just going to go right into it. So my sobriety date is November 15th, 2021, so I am sober just over two years. Um, I came into this program when I was 22, and when I came in, um, I was not happy to be here. Um, I think that there's a lot of, you know, things that led me here and, you know, I'm here to tell you a little bit about, um, how it was, what happened and how it is today. And as that relates to being young in recovery, but I think, you know, my whole experience in AA has been me being young in recovery. So hopefully, you know, I can say something that resonates with at least one person here today. Um, so I guess I'll start at the beginning, you know, my childhood, there's nothing really exciting there to mention. The only thing that sort of plays a role in, I guess, how my drinking got started is, um, you know, there was a lot of, um, contradictions and things like that in my family. So, you know, the thing that mattered the most to my parents was how we looked on the outside, uh, and how our, like how we would keep up appearances to the outside world. So, um, it was just basically, you know, they were very, um, high functional and very high achieving people. And we didn't really talk about our emotions. Um, the only thing was that as long as we looked good to outside people and outside organizations, then that was all that mattered. And so my drinking has a lot of contradictions in it because, um, I guess in some ways I tried to sort of manage it for a very long time. I tried to let those outside appearances not slide, and maybe that was what led me to come in even later than I probably should have landed in these rooms. Um, so I guess growing up like that, you know, I grew up in Etobicoke, not far from here. I grew up in just like a middle-class family, and... Um, Everything looked sort of fine on the outside, but on the inside, I never felt fine. And I think that was, you know, one of the things that started me trying to do things to get out of myself. And I think, you know, by the time I was a teenager, I was having a lot of anxiety. I was having depression spells and things like that. Um, But when I tried to kind of uh, mention that to my mom, she was, you know, from a European background and the way that she was raised, she didn't really believe in psychology or anything like that, so, or mental health, and um, so I kind of, I felt not understood, and I felt like I had nobody to share those feelings with, so I just kept it inside and tried to hide it and thought that as long as I looked fine on the outside, then um, then everything would be fine. Um, and so I just kind of continued like that throughout my teenage years. You know, I was always very involved in lots of sports. Um, I was good at school, not because I liked school at the time, but because, you know, that's what my parents wanted. That's what I thought was expected of me. So that's what I did. Um, and then, you know, but always feeling anxious and scared on the inside every time. So then when I first found alcohol, you know, it was um, just at a party and the first time, the first time I got drunk, nothing really crazy happened externally. You know, I didn't black out the first time I drank. I didn't throw up the first time I drank. Um, but what did happen was finally that inside turmoil and anxiety that I felt uh, for my whole entire life up until that time finally went away. Um, I finally felt a part of. I do remember, you know, that time was the first time I was ever able to go out on the dance floor. That was the first time I was ever able to talk to boys. That was the first time I was ever able to talk to those girls that I thought were always, you know, cooler than me and I was afraid of. All of a sudden, I felt like I was on their level. And so that's what alcohol did for me at that time. And so... I continued drinking throughout high school, but I started out drinking just socially. Um, and, you know, it would just be something that I associated with going out. And so during the week, I would never think about it. I would be in school. I would be in sports. Um, you know, I eventually applied to university. Um, but... Um, 
but yeah, but I, but I would be just waiting for those nights and waiting for those weekends to come around when finally I felt like I could exhale and the whole stress of that week would go away. And, um, and that was, that was my happy place, really. Those times were my happy places. As much as I hated being around people any other time, um, when I was drunk and when I was in those as, um, environments, I felt fine. And so, you know, that's how it continued for a few years. Um, the one other thing in my story um, from those days that kind of maybe was a bit of the reason when my drinking turned into less of a social thing um, and started slipping into an isolated thing was um, my dad did become an alcoholic when I was um, about 13 to 14. Before that, as I mentioned, he was very high functioning, very high achieving. Um, I never even saw him drunk before the age of 13. And then um, he just started drinking and it started very casually but progressed very quickly and so by the time I was finishing high school he was a full-blown alcoholic and so my main goal was to get out of the house and so I um without knowing this is what I was doing at the time, I was sort of following that geographical cure pattern. Um, you know, I thought that Etobicoke caused everybody to be an alcoholic, and so I thought if I could just get out of Etobicoke, uh, I would be safe from this, and I would do better, and I could move on, and I could have a good life. And so that's what I did. So I chose a university that was a few hours away um, in my, you know, and my criteria, I guess, for choosing the school was that, oh, it was a party school and it was far enough from home that it would be inconvenient for my parents to come visit frequently. Um, so I left and in university, uh, the drinking absolutely progressed. Um, you know, looking back at it now, uh, it already started, like it was, you know, I was partying very hard every weekend, but I also started drinking to fall asleep. Um, I was in residence my first year, so um, all that social anxiety came flooding back, and I was unable to kind of socialize with people when I was sober, so I would just get drunk and socialize with them. Um, and... That's just, I guess that's just how it progressed, and I guess I was able to still do school and keep it up for a while, um, and sort of keep those, as I said, outside appearances fine for a while, because I, um, I, I managed to keep those outside appearances fine for a while, um, because I didn't have any consequences, I guess, or real life consequences happening yet. The first consequence that happened was in my third year, um, after uh, I came back to Toronto for the summer, and that was when I got my first DUI. Um, didn't get into an accident or anything. I was, you know, driving on Canada Day. I swerved. They caught me. I not only uh, was very drunk, but had alcohol next to me in the car, so they arrested me. And um, I didn't chalk it up at all to being an alcoholic. I thought that it was stupid to drive on Canada Day when there were lots of cops out. Um, so I thought that I could have just chosen a better day to drink and drive. Um, and so I, once again, I only told one person about this, I, and I only told my mom. And I went back to school um, and acted like nothing happened and continued to drink and to party. Um, and then in my fourth year, I had my second consequence happen, and that was um, we went out for the night, we came back, and it was 3 a.m., and that's when maybe some people will get tired and go to bed, but that's usually I say, okay, when's our next, what's our next adventure? And so, you know, I had the smart idea of dragging my friends up to go climb on the roof of our apartment building, um, and I wanted to reach the highest point of that, and basically um, I blacked out while I was on that roof, and so I ended up falling off five stories. Um, and so that was my second consequence. Um, so I woke up uh, in the hospital two days later, um, and, you know, I had lots of broken bones. I was in a coma um, for two days, and I, um, yeah, that's that was the consequence of my continued drinking. And I guess um, this is maybe where somebody who's a hard drinker would take a look at their life and say, Clearly, I can't manage my alcohol. I have a problem with drinking. Uh, maybe I should do something about it. 
Um, you know, once again, I don't think I fully chalked it up to alcoholism. Um, I kind of was making the excuses that, well, we were all drunk. You know, it was an accident. It could have happened to any of us. And so I stayed away from alcohol for a few months simply because I was recovering. I was in physical rehab. Um, and then eventually, you know, that... Um, for me, it wasn't that the physical craving came back. It was like the FOMO and wanting to, seeing all my friends graduating and I was behind and I was going to graduate a year later and they're going out and they're starting their lives. They're getting condos. They're, you know, partying it up downtown Toronto. And um, that summer, like eventually, you know, and it started out with just one glass of wine and then didn't touch it for another month and then you know a few beers then another month didn't touch it and then eventually I'm back to partying you know um the same way that I was um probably hobbling around because my leg hadn't even fully healed yet um but that's how much drinking and you know the feeling gave me of being included that's how much uh it was important to me over anything else and so, so I, you know, was back out, um, and this time I did start blacking out a lot. Um, after that accident happened, you know, I had a lot of PTSD from it, and um, I didn't really do much therapy at the time, so I, I wanted the easier, softer way. I started taking anxiety medication, and you know, on the bottle it says don't, um, don't take with alcohol, but um, I was, you know. Before I got very drunk, I was kind of taking it and chasing it down with some wine, you know, thinking I'm being responsible because I'm taking care of my mental health. Um, so I started blacking out a lot that summer, and that was the summer before I came in. Um, I managed somehow to graduate that following um, October, and um, at this point, I knew I had a problem. I was losing friends left and right. You know, they didn't want to go out with me anymore because I was, like, causing a scene, getting us kicked out of places. Um, they just, it wasn't fun anymore for them. And, um, you know, so I started, I think I started now to realize I had a problem. And I finally told my mom, because like I said, you know, I hadn't lived with her for four years. She didn't really know 100% what was going on. Um, she just saw my good grades come in and, you know, the internships and everything. And so, um, and that accident, I managed to somehow kind of convince her that it didn't really have that much to do with alcohol. Um, and, um, so I then finally told her, and I said, you know, I have a problem. Just let me graduate school first, and then um, I'll go to rehab. And so she started looking into a few places for me. So I graduated in October, and then I didn't, um, I didn't, uh, I just... I don't know. I didn't go, I guess, right away, like, because then I thought, oh, well, I'm fine. Look, I've managed to graduate. Maybe I just need a job, and then I'll be an adult, and then I'll grow up, and everything will be fine. And so I kind of kept putting it off. And uh, I, during that September and October to graduate, I was managing kind of my drinking, so I thought it was getting better. And then um, on October 28th of 2022, so two weeks before I came into AA, I uh, decided for absolutely no reason to get drunk, uh, drive my car again, and this time I blacked out while I was driving. I woke up, you know, in the jail cell the next morning, and um, this time the difference was that I wasn't shocked. I wasn't screaming and blaming everybody else. I wasn't doing all of that. Um, I knew it was more of like a disappointment. It was like you knew that you had a problem. Why didn't you come in sooner? Why did you wait for it to get worse? And so then, you know, my lawyer, um, I got a lawyer, and so, um, you know, he said, do you think you have a problem with drinking? I said, yes. He said, would you be willing to work with somebody, like a counselor? I said, yes. So the counselor, you know, I started working with him, and, um, you know, he saw me. He 12-stepped me without me knowing it at the time, but he said, um, do you think you have a problem with alcohol? I said, yes. He said, okay, well, why don't we try some controlled drinking? So he said at the time, you know, the limit for uh, females in Canada was um, six drinks a week, se seven drinks a week. So he said, why don't you start with that? And I go, perfect. And in my head, I'm like, okay, that's one night you can get buzzed or two nights you can sort of get tipsy. Um, that's clearly not what he meant by that, but that's what I did. So I managed that first week on that seven drinks. And then the second week by Tuesday, I was already, you know, two bottles in and so um I went back to him and I said, I think um, we need to rethink this limit. And then he said, I think 
uh, he basically said, if you, if the judge were to ask me right now, did you make any progress on your drinking? I'd honestly have to say no. And so that was, and then he recommended that, you know, I think sobriety is the way to go. And he said, before you see me the next month, I want you to go to 10 AA meetings. And so that's what I did. And so I came in and during the first week that I was in there, um, I mentioned I had lost most of my friends before this. And so during that first week I came in and on the, th and I hadn't told anybody about that car accident or anything that had happened. I wasn't planning on telling anybody I was going to be an AA, but, um, on that third day that I was in, I started getting all these text messages from people that I haven't heard from, you know, in months. Um, so I'm asking, are you okay? How have you been? And it was all came on the same day, and it was very weird. And then I realized um, I had a bad feeling. And then I realized, finally, I called one of them, and they told me what had happened. And basically, that second car accident that I had, uh, that was two weeks before, um, the cops, body cam, I guess, had recorded it. And uh, it went viral on this uh, little platform you might know called TikTok. Um, that went viral, and um, so now everybody knew, uh, you know, what had happened. And um, basically, I absolutely wanted to kill myself. Um, that was almost what I did, you know, that night that that happened. Um, but luckily, I had at my first meeting in AA, met and connected with one woman who kept calling me, and I had gone to three meetings with her so far, and I called her blubbering, you know, not being able to breathe or anything. Um, she probably couldn't understand what I was saying, but um, all she said was, okay, I'll see you at a meeting tomorrow, <laughs> and keep coming back. And um, that was just what I did. Um, but I absolutely, you know, didn't want to live. I didn't want to be alive. I thought my life was over. Um, and I don't know. I, I thought, I guess I, my plan was just not to come back. And, but I kept coming mostly for her because I thought that she would be upset if I didn't show up. Um, so I kept coming and, um, you know, eventually I, I, eventually she told me because I kept complaining that I don't want to be here yet. I don't want to be sober. I don't want to be sober at 22. And, you know, something she told me was, okay, well, you know, you're 22. Um, let's say you try this sobriety thing for a year and absolutely nothing good happens. Um, you know, you can leave, you'll be, no one's keeping you here. You'll be 23 when you get out. And so, you know, you have your whole life ahead of you to <laughs> go party and do whatever you want. And so, uh, and then the other thing she said was, but you have to give it your all. Um, because, you know, she didn't use that word. I think it would have turned me off if she said half measures availed us nothing at the time. Um, but she said something related to those lines, basically like it's not going to work if you don't go all in and you're not going to feel the results, um, you know, until about a year because she's like your first six months, you'll probably just basically be detoxing and it'll feel like hell. And so those two things, you know, kept me here. Um, I thought for a while the way that I was raised, uh, very Catholic, I thought it was like sort of a scorecard. So, you know, I thought I did all these bad things. I was such a bad person. You know, I caused so much harm to my friends and family for X amount of years. So I have to be in this program and be sober for X amount of years as a punishment. And then it'll even out. Your slate will be clean and then you can go back out again. So I found, you know, a few days ago, so I started keeping, um, so I, I'm in science now, and so I like experiments, especially social experiments. And so um, I treated it as a social experiment. So I started journaling almost every single day, and you know, uh, because I wanted to see if I actually was going to get better or not. And on the off chance that I decided to stay after a year, I'm like, maybe my experience would help somebody. Um, so I found this, you know, 
note that I wrote at 84, and I would keep the sober count at the top of my journal, um, so it'd be easy for me to find, you know, into like an index. And so I found this note that I wrote in my journal, 84 days sober, I wrote, I'll give it three more years, and then at 25, I'll kill myself. So I was very serious about that, you know? Um, it's not just when you look in hindsight and when you exaggerate, that was fully my plan in that first year. Um, and so I guess, you know, eventually I started to give in, but I was still really unhappy to be here and I didn't want to, you know, have fun or anything like that in sobriety. I didn't believe I could. And so I was very resistant for a long time. You know, some women would ask, would tell me, oh, you're so lucky to be here when you're young. And, um, I said, no, you're lucky that you came in here when you're older because you got to live out your youth, you got to party, you got to do everything you wanted, and then just retire to AA. I'm like, what else does anybody do, you know? <laughs> um, and so I said, so, so one time I said that to this woman in my home group, and you know, she said, you're so lucky to be in here uh, in your 20s. And I said, no, you're lucky that you got to you know, live it up in your 20s. She goes, well, at least you'll remember your 20s. And so that really stuck with me as something. Um, so then eventually I did start to, at six months, I joined a volleyball team with some people um, in my home group, which was a huge sort of milestone for me. It was like the first socially social things I started doing with people um, you know, on a regular basis in sobriety. Um, I realized I didn't really know how to interact with people. Um, if it didn't revolve around drinking, it was almost like I was 14 again. And so that helped me kind of get out of my shell and learn how to do that. Um, in terms of another cool thing that has happened is amends. Those people that I mentioned at the beginning, those friends from my drinking days that, you know, hated me. And, um, you know, I didn't... Uh, I wasn't even thinking about step eight when I was started to think about the steps. Um, it seemed so far away for me. But when I did think about it, I thought because of my analogy, I thought, oh, well, by that time, I'll have suffered enough in the program that it'll just even out. You know, my suffering will cancel out all the bad things that I did. Um, no, that, my sponsor told me that's not how it works. And so, you know, I've made amends since to people that I would have told you in the first few weeks um, would hate my guts. I was convinced that all these people would absolutely, you know, slam the door on me um, and not want to see me ever. And, you know, I've made amends to a bunch of them since. And there's this one person that, uh, my old roommate, that we had a huge falling out because of my drinking. And, um, you know, I reached out to her to make the amends. And she said, you know, um, I don't want to rehash the past. It's okay. Um, I'm okay. Like, we don't need to do this. Um, and so that was somebody, when I went back to school this year, that was somebody that I was really afraid of running into. So I knew that I had to make this amends, but I was really scared. So for three months, we were on the same campus, and I was afraid to run into her. Um, and I never did run into her. And then finally, I reached out in December, at the end of that semester, to make that amends. Um, and she didn't want to make the amends. She didn't want to see me. But the very next day, I ran into her and was able to walk past her and not be absolutely ashamed and humiliated and was just able to kind of keep my head up high. And I think that's when I realized that the amends, you know, really is for you to not be embarrassed uh, to be out in the world anymore. And so that was sort of one of those God moments that happened. And another amends I did make that did go, you know, they did want to um, talk to me was, you know, thank you, um, was somebody who I... You know, this person was there for me a lot in that fourth year of school after my accident. You know, they basically carried me through school. I don't know if I would have graduated without them. And, um, you know, I absolutely took advantage of them and was not grateful. And we had a big falling out right before I started drinking. So for two years, we didn't talk. And, you know, I um, finally reached out to him in September on all sorts of, you know, social medias and everything. And, uh, you know, it was like I would like to make this amends. Didn't hear back for months, but 
um, I gave it my all. I really, you know, tried to reach out. And um, a few weeks ago, you know, he messaged me back saying, hey, you know, I was in a bad place, but let's do the amends. And it turns out that he's going to start at the same school in the same program a year later that I'm in right now next year. And I got to say, please let me know if there's anything that I can do to help. You know, I have notes, I have connections, like I can get you hooked up. And I was able to actually, you know, make a living amends in that way to somebody who really, you know, helped me get through a really hard time when I was drinking and when I was ungrateful for that. So, yeah, I think those are just some of the things and some of the gifts that I have in this program. And now, you know, I can look out into this room and just, like, see so many people that I know that are here to support me, and it's all because of this program. And as somebody who used to feel, you know, alone my whole life, at least on the inside, um, I feel like with this program, I can actually not feel alone anymore. And so I think that's what sobriety has given me. So thank you. Now for our second panelist, please help me welcome Cameron from the Prince Edward Group. Good afternoon, friends. I'm an alcoholic member of the Bluerdale Group. My name's Cameron. So today, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Tanya. Tanya was one of the first young people that I met in the rooms of AA, and uh, she works an amazing program, and uh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for that. But yeah, today it's my job to share with you guys a little bit about uh, what it was like, what happened, and what my life's like today. And uh, I'll just get right into it as well. Uh, I was born in Etobicoke as well, middle class family, three siblings, um, you know, nothing too crazy. Uh, I lived in a uh, pretty contradicting household, you know, on the one side of my family, it was all church, religion, heavily active in the church, and on the other side of the family, alcoholism and addiction ran rampant, um, but I didn't know that at the time. So growing up, things were a little bit complicated, and when I was about eight years old, um, you know, I remember I... I remember vividly, when I was about eight or nine years old, I was uh, taken, I skipped the day of summer camp, I didn't feel like going, so I was with uh, a third party that was watching over me, and they took me aside and they uh, sat me down and they told me that, you know, my parents were going through an ugly divorce, they told me about alcoholism, about infidelity, and, uh, you know, at eight years old, you don't really know how to comprehend and do with all that knowledge, I didn't fully understand, I still don't to this day fully understand um, what that was all about, but at the end of that, uh, the third party told me, I'm only telling you because I trust you won't tell anyone else and uh, that taught me a couple things it taught me one that my emotions really don't matter what I'm feeling doesn't matter I got to shove everything down and two at eight years old it kind of also taught me that the world sucks that, that was my opinion on the world at the time um, and I felt this hole I felt this hole so for a whole year before my parents you know came out and told me and my siblings I held on to the secret and just kept it deep down and would try anything to fill the void. I would do anything that I could. Um, but I witnessed the alcoholism and the effects of it on, uh, on myself, my siblings, and my family. And uh, at a very young age, I promised myself, like so many others I've heard from the podium, that I would never be like that person. I would never want to be the person that hurts the ones I love the most and, you know, be so selfish. Little did I know that they were sick and had a disease, but I'll get into that later. Um, so yeah, I tried, you know, I made a promise that I wasn't going to. Um, after the divorce, nobody else in my family drank, and I tried filling the void with anything I could. I played hockey for a number of years, I was a goalie, I took many pucks off to the head, maybe that's part of the reason why I'm here, but it's uh, definitely not the full. Uh, I tried, you know, church, I tried everything, video games, anything I could just to fill the void, but uh, nothing was really working for me. And as a, as a young teenager, I, I decided that, you know, I'm not going to stick around very long. I just decided that this, this wasn't for me. It'd be great for you guys, but for me, I just didn't see myself sticking around past 20, so I didn't make a plan. I didn't plan out a future. Whenever anybody asked me, you know, what I'd planned, I just came up with whatever on the spot, and then I had a go-to story. Um, and things weren't going well growing up, you know. I was in a rough spot mentally, and when I was 17, I was out on a camping trip, and uh, somebody offered me a drink. And I was, uh, I was going through a tough time in my life, and I was like, you know what? 
it can't hurt. It can't hurt. I've had enough. I'm tired of feeling the way I'm feeling. I may as well try this out too. And once I had that first drink on the camping trip, it was, uh, it was game over. It was game over for me. The second I had that first drink, it was a feeling of total euphoria and bliss and just, I felt like I belonged. I felt like I had arrived. I had found something that, uh, you know, maybe this place isn't so bad. Maybe I'll stick around a little bit longer. You know, if I can, if I can just drink and, you know, do what I want to do, things won't be so bad. And that was the start of a four day bender. And, uh, you know, immediately, Immediately afterwards, I was filled with this shame, guilt, and remorse because I'd, I'd known and I'd felt what alcoholism had done to me and my family, but on the same hand, it was my medicine. It was what made me feel good, and it was this constant battle within me, always knowing that what I'm doing is wrong, but it's making me feel so good. It's, it's making me feel like I belong here. And um, after that, you know, being 17, I couldn't get it easily, but where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, from a young age, I found out about the fine art of drinking alone. And that's, that's what I love to do. I can't remember when I first started doing it, but uh, that was my favorite spot. Just alone in my room, pounding back as many drinks as I could. And, uh, you know, for two years, for two years, from 17 till about 19, that's what I would did. Nobody else in my household drinks, so I couldn't take from anybody else. I was like, man, what a, what a time. But uh, sneaking in alcohol was no problem. It was the, uh, you know, getting rid of all the empties. I kind of felt like I was like a NASCAR pit crew on the clock. You know, as soon as everybody left the house, I had like an hour to get all the bottles from, you know, upstairs my room to the garage. I had to go out the garage because there was a camera on the front door so that nobody could see me jumping through all these uh, mental hoops and it was just it was insane and then in uh, November of 2019 uh, after a long day of drinking by this point I was a daily drinker I was drinking for oblivion every day because it was what made me feel good it was what I felt could keep me going November 2019 um, after a long day of drinking uh, to keep a long story short, thought I was dying, ran into my little sister's room, told her to call an ambulance, and uh, the paramedics get there. My dad wasn't home at the time, and uh, the paramedics get there, and my dad gets home as they're just about to take me off to the hospital. And I see my dad, and I just completely break down. I'm a blubbering mess. I'm so filled with shame, guilt, remorse. I felt like I should know better. I felt like, you know, I'd seen what this disease does firsthand. I'd felt it, more importantly. How did I end up here? And I just couldn't look at him. I couldn't look at him. I went off to the hospital, and uh, in the back of that ambulance, I remember, you know, I was pretty inebriated at the time, but I remember sitting in the back of the ambulance and almost cracking a smile at one point, because I'm like, you know what? It's out in the open. I'm finally on the way to getting better. This has to be it. And uh, little did I know what, uh, what I had in store for me left. So after that incident, uh, I spent about two weeks sober, just white knuckling it. And during that two weeks, uh, you know, I had heard about AA, you know, whether through movies, music, whatever. I'd heard about it, so I looked up a meeting, and at 19, I decided to walk to my first AA meeting. I got to right outside the church, and I just kept walking. I couldn't bring myself to walk in there. I don't think I was ready at the time. I just, I don't know why I couldn't do it, but I just couldn't. I kept walking. And uh, I went home, and I went right back to drinking. And, uh, you know, now that the cat was out of the bag, my family was a little bit more aware of my drinking, and it became a lot more difficult to drink at home. But, uh, again, like I said earlier, where there's a will, there's a way, and we always find a way. So continued drinking. I'd get caught every once in a while, lie through my teeth, I'd lie through my teeth. It was a slip. It just happened. I had one day. I'd been sober for like three months before this, when in reality I'd been on like a three-week bender of just every day drinking myself into oblivion. It was a very challenging time in my life. I hated the way I felt on the inside. I hated who I was becoming when I was drinking. I, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. And all those emotions started bubbling up. And I did what I knew best to do. I shoved them all back down. I just poured poured back the liquor and uh, shoved all those emotions down because I didn't know how to deal with them properly. I went through uh, quite a few psychiatrists, counselors, things like that after my parents divorced when I was younger. And, um, you know, eventually in, uh, at the beginning of 2020, uh, I realized that, you know, maybe this drinking thing has a tighter hold on me than I, than I realized. And maybe I need some professional help. So, uh, 
In 2020, I started uh, receiving some outside help from CAMH, and uh, I went down to for my intake assessment, and that was the first time I realized that this disease doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care what race, you know, how much money you make, how old you are. It really doesn't discriminate. Um, I walked in there and just saw people of all kinds, and uh, you know. Nobody was happy, of course. Everybody's down, depressed. And it's not exactly where you want to be. It's not where anybody wants to find themselves. But uh, I started receiving some help. And uh, that was in February of 2020. And then COVID hit. So all my stuff went online. And I just looked at, co looked at COVID as another excuse to keep drinking. I thought, well, the world's ending. I'm going to go out with a bang, too. So... I kept drinking, and now with COVID happening, my family was home a lot more frequently. It made my life a lot more difficult, sneaking in drinks, sneaking out empties, hiding well, I'm drunk, and, you know, I did some things I'm really not proud of. I did a lot of things I'm not proud of. There were days when, uh, there were days at work where uh, I'd be drinking at work, I ended up losing that job. You know, just told my dad, ah, I'm just, you know, I'm taking some time off to try and try and really focus on my sobriety. Not true at all. I was a slave to alcohol. I went to my job to get money to pay for alcohol. And all I could think about when I wasn't drinking was when I was going to start drinking. And it was really challenging. It was a really challenging time in my life. Uh, and I'll kind of fast forward through this part. But over the course of uh, the next couple years throughout COVID, you know, I would drink, I would get caught, lie through my teeth. Things were, uh, things were not going well. I would be found passed out on the bathroom floor, passed out with my head in the dog's water bowl. Um, I drank for oblivion. And, uh, you know, I didn't drink like I wanted it now. I drank like I wanted it 10 minutes ago. And that's, that's how I drank throughout my entire drinking career, if you will. So things at home were getting tough. Um, and then in 2021, I'm like, okay. I need a job. If I get a job, everything will be fixed. So I decided uh, I'm going to get a job, and everything's going to be good now. So I got a job at a golf course, and that was not the smartest idea, to put it lightly. Uh, I thought that, you know, because I had to be up early, I, would, I wouldn't drink. And, uh, you know, it just means, meant that I started my drinking a little bit earlier, finished a little bit earlier as well. And uh, there was one gentleman who's one of us that worked there. And I remember I'd be driving down this long driveway to, uh, to the shop where we worked. And it'd be like 5.30 in the morning, I'd offer this guy a ride in. And he says, no, no, don't worry about it. I got to finish this first. And he's holding a beer can. And I go, that guy, that's an alcoholic over there. Meanwhile, I'm, you know, drinking myself into oblivion every night. And within a couple months, I was that same guy walking down the driveway with a beer in my hand at 5.30 in the morning, you know, on my way to work. And things were tough at home. You know, my family couldn't trust me anymore. My dad was having some serious conversations with me and uh, some really tough ones. There's one I'll never forget. I was with him and uh, he goes, you know, I saw alcoholism destroy my, my marriage, he says, and it's killing me to destroy my son. And that cut through me like a knife. That was, I wish I could say that at that point, I turned my life around, everything got better. Uh, but in the on, God's honest truth, I went up to my room and I kept drinking because I didn't like how I felt. I, I hated everything about myself. And so I started going to detoxes. Um, I went to my first overnight detox when I was 22, and I was absolutely scared out of my mind. And, uh, you know, I thought, this is it, this is the end. So I started my, you know, morning off with a few beers, a few shots, went off to detox, and, uh, you know, my higher power was really looking out for me when I went off to detox for the first time. I was, uh, it was tail end of COVID, so no roommates, but there was a group of about seven or eight of us, um, that were there, and they were all fairly young guys. I didn't know what to expect, but it was all, like, I was 22 at the time. There, were, you know, I think the oldest guy there, he was 28, and then there was, like, 22 to 28 was kind of the age range. And it almost felt like a summer camp for addicts and alcoholics more than it did a detox, but it was awesome. I had a, I had a great time, and in that safe environment, I felt good. I came out of it feeling good. Uh, you know, none of us had a plan on how we were going to stay sober once we were out of detox, but we exchanged numbers, and I thought, you know, this is, this is it. This is going to be good. So I left detox, and I was feeling good. And slowly, the dominoes started to fall. 
Slowly the dominoes started to fall. One guy went out, the next guy went out, and it wasn't long before I went back to drinking as well. I just couldn't manage to string anything more than a couple weeks of sobriety together on my own terms. And, you know, that was brought more lying to my family. Drinking and driving, thankfully no charges, but I could have been a few times. And more de day detoxes. And then in February of uh, 2023, February 22nd, 2023, uh, I found myself back up in detox in Oshawa. And it was a very different experience for me than the first time around when I was out there. Uh, it was my second time there in a year, so I thought, I, I went in feeling very like, you know, I was going to be the big man on campus. I'd been here a couple times. I know the lay of the land. And I get into my, uh, to my room, and my roommate goes, oh, it's my 10th time here. And I'm like, okay. I got brought back down to reality very quickly. But uh, this time, I was the youngest by probably about 20, 30 years. And, you know, I really do feel like my higher power was holding up a mirror for me, um, saying that I have, I have a couple options in my life right now. I can keep going the way I'm going, in and out of detoxes, my family not wanting me in their life, passing out on the floor, blowing all my money, not, not worrying about tomorrow, or I can start to do something to change. And uh, in that detox, I got very close with these gentlemen. I found out about their stories, what they had been through, what their lives were like, and I realized that I was not far behind them. I realized that any moment, you know, that any of those things could happen to me. And so I left detox, or sorry, sorry, I'll pardon, I'll back up a little bit. One time when we were in, there in detox, one of the guys asked, you know, have you, have you ever tried this AA stuff? And uh, my roommate goes, ah, it's just a bunch of old white guys uh, sitting in a church basement complaining about their lives. And so I looked around and I'm like, other than the church basement, I'm like, I'm pretty, we're pretty much here. So <laughs> I thought, I thought, how bad could it be? I left detox on a, on a Sunday, and I went home, and I wasn't feeling good. It wasn't like the first time when I left detox. I was feeling self-pity, woe is me. I'm 22. I can't drink. I can't live with alcohol. I can't live without it. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I remembered the guys talking about AA. So I Googled an AA meeting, you know, made sure that it was open, it was tail end of COVID, and I went to the Bloordale group. And I got there, you know, five minutes late, hood on, sunglasses, hat, you know, total newcomer special. And uh, it was a 20-year medallion. I walked in, the room was packed like it is today. It was a 20-year medallion. And I didn't say a word to anybody that night. But, uh, you know, it wasn't like when I walked into Cam H. People were smiling. People were laughing. People were having a good time. And I'm like, this. Uh, I, I thought, I'm like, this can't be right. This, there's no way all these people are sober for so long. I don't believe it. But uh, even though I didn't talk to anybody, I felt that, uh, you know, the slogan, I, you are no longer alone. I, I felt that same hope that I was feeling in the back of the ambulance. So I decided to, uh, to keep going to more meetings. And, uh, you know, within that first week, I met the gentleman who would eventually become my sponsor. And, uh, you know, he said, give it 90 days. Give it 90 days. And if at the end of the 90 days, you're not happy, we'll refund your misery. So I, I was like, okay, okay, I'll try it for 90 days. Not for me. I didn't care about me when I came in at the end. I didn't like myself. I hated myself when I came into these rooms. I... I didn't do it for myself. I said, my family deserves for me to give this an honest shot when I first came in. And that's what I originally came in for. And so, you know, that first 90 days, it was, it was really challenging. I had my first ORC last year, and I was about three weeks sober. I was just in complete and utter shock. I held on to my sponsor like I was his shadow and did not leave him alone. But uh, what an incredible experience. It was, uh, you know, and after the 90 days... After the 90 days, it's amazing what happened when I was willing to put in the work. You know, life slowly started to get better. You know, I was able to look at myself in the mirror. I was, you know, slowly building relationships back that I had burnt down beforehand. And it didn't come without its challenges, you know. Those first three months, you know, my fr the two friends that I had left before burning my life to the ground or that stuck with me, they're like, oh, you know, you're 23, you're 22, you're 23, you're just having fun, you're not an alcoholic. And, you know, there's a big part of me that wanted to be like, you know what, you're right, let's go drink. That's exactly what I wanted to do. But I, I told myself, 90 days, I'm going to give it 90 days. And at the end of the 90 days, I had a job, you know, people could trust me. I was active in my home group. And, you know, I'd started meeting some really incredible people in these rooms. So I'm like, okay, after 90 days, I'm like, 
you know what, maybe I'll stick around. Things are starting to get a little bit better. I'm able to start to look at myself in the mirror, and things got good. <laughs> things got good fast, so I stuck around. And yeah, what is my life like today? It's an incredible honor and uh, privilege to be up here and sharing at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, especially at the ORC. Um, my life today, it's good. It doesn't come without its problems. You know, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, but uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous has given me everything good in my life. Today, my family can trust me. Today, me and my dad are back to having a good relationship. You know, that little sister that I ran into her room telling her to call the paramedics. You know, she, for my one year, um, she set up a bunch of balloons and a nice sign for when I woke up. And um, I have AA and all of you people to thank for that. It's been an incredible journey. And, you know, I've met so many amazing people, and I'm just so, so grateful to be here today. And, you know, I wish you all a happy 24. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.